let's say Pete over here thinks that he's a pretty good investor. So what he does is, or he has an idea that says, well, look, I'm going to create a corporation. And I'm going to get a bunch of people to contribute money to that corporation. And then I'll manage that money. And maybe I'll take a little fee for myself so that I can um, maybe hire some analysts or get some computers or, for some, or get some office space. So what he does is he sets up a corporation. Let's say he sets up a corporation right over here. And let's say the way the way he first sets up the corporation, let's say it just has four shares. And I'm making the number really small just to make the drawing and the math easy. This wouldn't be realistic. Normally it would be something in the hundreds or thousands of shares, or maybe even more than that. But let's say it has four shares. And let's say all of the four shares are owned by Pete initially, just to simplify the the explanation. And he puts in $400. $400 into this corporation. So another way to think about it, in exchange for him putting $400 into this corporation, he gets four shares. Or each share, each share is worth is worth $100. Each of these shares right over here. And so what he does is he registers this corporation, and I'm talking about a, a US specific case, but there's similar types of organizations in other countries. He registers this organization right over here with the US SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. And he also registers himself with the SEC. Or even better, he registers a management company that he runs with the SEC. So let's call it Pete, Pete Inc. is a corporation he starts off that he also registers with the SEC. And when he registers with the SEC, he tells them that, look, this company right over here, we're going to issue more shares for more people to contribute money. And I'm going to manage this money right over here. And I'm just going to take a percentage of the total assets under management. Sometimes you'll see AUM used. That just means assets under management. That will go to Pete Inc. every year for figuring out the best place to invest this money. And it's usually on the order of about 1%, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. So 1% per year. So right now, with only $400 assets on, $400 under management, it would only be about $4 per year. But since he registered with the SEC, he can call himself a mutual fund, and he can solicit funds from the public. So it is a mutual fund. He has met, he's jumped through all of the hoops that the SEC sets up for him. So he can market. He can market himself as some type of great fund manager. We don't know if that's true or not. And he can also solicit funds from the public. So from from the public. And we're going to see in future videos there are other funds, especially hedge funds, that can't just, that one, they can't market, and they can't take funds from the public. Those can only take funds from certain types of sophisticated investors. And what happens in Pete's fund, and this is going to be an open-ended mutual fund that we're showing here, and most mutual funds are like that. Let's say that Sal comes along. He likes Pete's marketing materials. And he says, hey, I, wanna, I want Pete to manage my money too. So Sal goes and he gives $100 and, he, and says, Pete, give me a share. So Pete creates another share right over here. He creates another share. He gives it to Sal. So he gets one share. That's me. I get one share. And then in exchange, I gave $100 to the fund. So now the fund has the fund has $500. So this is another $100 right over here. And now Pete's annual fee is going to be 1% of this whole thing, or $5 a year. And if this whole thing grows, let's say this whole thing doubles to from $500, let's see it doubles to $1,000, then that $1,000 is essentially split amongst these five shares now. So all of the people will essentially have their money doubled, minus whatever Pete's expenses are. So let's say that a year goes by, and then even after paying Pete the 1%, so it had $500 of assets under management, this whole assets under management a year later goes to Let's say it goes to $1,000. So Pete either is really good or really lucky or a little bit of both. So it goes to $1,000. So let me draw it like this. So now it is at $1,000. And it still has the same five investors here. And I'm lucky enough to be one of them. So here are the five investors. Let me draw the share. So there's one, two, three, four, five shares. 
Now, each of these shares, the, well, the $1,000 is called the NAV, or the net asset value. So let me give you, give you that piece of terminology. It just means net asset value. And so there's an NAV per share. The NAV per share right over here is $200. I just took the total NAV, and I just divided it by the shares. And what's special about an open-ended mutual fund is that the close, or at the end of every day, Either new shares can be removed from the fund, or it could be created for the fund. So in the first video, I showed how I wanted to buy into the fund, so I bought a share. And that increased the NAV, and it also increased the number of shares. He had to create a share for me to buy. He didn't, su he didn't sell me a share that already existed. So you can imagine after this type of a performance, more people would want to buy shares. So now they would have to buy in, to make things fair, at $200 per share, because that's the current NAV per share. So let's say that five more people want to buy in at $200 per share. So what Pete would do, or what this mutual fund, it's not Pete really, it's the corporation, it would create five new shares. So one, two, three, four, five. If there was only, if there was only one person that day, it would create one share that day. If there was 10 people that day, it would create 10 shares that day. And it could keep doing this. And the NAV of each of these are $200, so it gives these shares to each of these people, and they had to contribute $200. So essentially, it puts another $1,000 into the pool that Pete can now manage. And so now he's met the total NAV for the fund is $2,000 now, and Pete will get his 1% management fee off of this entire $2,000. Now let's say that we fast forward a little bit. We fast forward a little bit to, let's say Pete starts having a not so good year. So let's say we fast forward a year past that, and Pete's, Pete has a, minus, a negative 10% return. So if you started at $2,000, and that's when you include taking his management fee out, you start at $2,000, you lose 10% in one year, so it goes down to $1,800. Let me do this in a new color. So now he's at $1,800. And it's not completely at, drawn to scale, but hopefully you get the idea. So now he is at $1,800. $1,800, $1,800. But you still have a total of 10 shares. You still have a total of 10 shares. So let me draw, try, do my best to draw the 10 shares. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. These should be of equal size. And now the NAV per share, NAV per share is going to be 1,800 divided by 10 or $180. And let's say that I get a little bit freaked out by this recent performance, and I have some other commitments with my money. So I say, Pete, you need to buy this, my share back for me. So what Pete does is he would give me back $180. So the total NAV would, be, would lose $180. So it would go down $180. So we would take this out of it. 1,800 minus 180 is 1,620. So now it is 1620. And they would buy back a share from me. So they would cancel one of the shares. But notice, the NAV per share does not change. By me redeeming my share, it does not change what happens to everyone else. Now you have 1620 divided by 9 shares. That should still get you to be $180 per share, if I did my math right. So 1800 divided by minus 180 gets you 1620. It should still be $180. $180 per share. But this is the nature of an open-ended fund. You can keep creating shares and selling them to the public to raise more money. Or when someone wants their money back, you essentially buy the share back from them, give them their money when you buy it back, and you remove that share. So an open-ended fund, really at the close of every trading day, can keep growing or shrinking. It can eat keep adding more and more investors, or their investors can take their money back. What's difficult about this? from the fund manager's point of view, is that they have to manage this. They have to manage this constant buying and selling with the public. They have to manage the paperwork. And if you think about it, they can't have all of their money invested in, in relatively illiquid assets, or even in regular stocks. They have to keep some amount of their money, and it's usually like 3 to 5%. They have to keep some of this $2,000 before he lost my money. They have to keep some of it in cash. And from an investor's point of view, they would say, well, if I'm good at investing, I, shouldn't, I should try to minimize the amount of cash that I have, because I'm not getting a return on cash. But because it's open-ended, because investors might come by and say, hey, I want my money, you have to have a little bit of cash 
on it, it, as part of the asset pool in order to be able to buy people's shares back.